dear viewers, wherever you are, hello and welcome to this new episode of your program, Spectra. Democracy, pluralism, um, constitutional monarchy, secularism are all terms that are very important in our lives. People hear about them all the time, all around the world, and they try to find out the true meaning of them. But this requirement of trying to find the true meaning of these terms becomes really imperative, becomes a must. If you're living in one of the most advanced and most liberal countries in the world like Canada. So what are the true meaning of these terms and how do they affect our day-to-day -day lives? What is the mandate of the government of Canada and of political parties? To shed more light on this, I'm really delighted to be accompanied tonight by MPP Sharif Sabawi, who's a member of the Ontario Parliament. He is also the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Heritage, Tourism, Sports and Culture Industries. MPP Sharif Sabawi, it's a real pleasure to have you with us tonight. It's my pleasure, Mohammed, to be with you here today. Thank you very much again for being with us. And um, to start off, like, can you shed some light on um, a word that is very controversial and sometimes people cannot really understand the meaning of a secular state? So Canada is definitely a democracy. It is a constitutional monarchy. It's a, it's a country that is run by a constitution. Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II is only a symbol of our heritage, but the people who rule Canada day to day are the Canadian through the Canadian Parliament that is elected by Canadians. But Canada is also a secular state. Um, what is the true meaning of secular secularism? Because, um, you know, sometimes or many times people um, use the term secularism interchangeably with atheism, or they believe that secularism or a secular state is an anti-religious, anti-religion government. I, I think the confusion is not there in the English. Like in the English version, it's clear. Like secularism is different than atheism. Uh, to be an atheist doesn't have anything to do to be a secular or not. Like this is different. Uh, the confusion came from using the, Ar the Arabization, the Arabization of Almania, Ladinia, Liberalia. The, the terms in Arabic are confusing. But I don't see the people. And who maybe are possibly English in other languages too. In other non English languages, possibly too. Could be, could, could be, could be. But again, like the, 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 the confusion comes from the translation or the translation adopted by some of the powers so if i if it's up to my uh, uh interest to uh tend all the secularism to be like uh, atheists to help my cause i will do almania equivalent to ilhad or the almania the secularism is against the religion uh, secularism has nothing to do with religion, and not at all. Like there's no connections. This is like conveying apples to oranges, right? So uh, there could be a very good religious person, but he's secular. His beliefs in in the politics side is secular. So you can't compare this to that. Uh, the confusion I don't see that confusion in people who speak oh, good good English, or English people. Or oh, yeah, the confusion happening in our background communities because we are coming from different areas where they use those words interchangeable which is not like this is something and that's something else but they were being used misused interchangeably for a reason political serve political reasoning majority of time which caused that confusion and the people arrive here with that confusion and they need some time to discover if they did i mean sometimes they just live their life with that belief until God knows when, until they ran into a situation where somebody can speak to them, and then they discover that they were misunderstood. And again, like uh, 
clearing that mis misunderstanding doesn't mean that they will change their mind because it have been years and years implanted in the way they think. It's going to be very difficult even to change their mind. They might realize that, yes, I think I misconfused it, but to change, I think very difficult. Uh, this is a very hot term and a very hot topic. And so um, secularism is basically separation of religion and state. So it's not a theocracy. It's not like a religion is not, um, you know, uh, does not impose itself, does not override, it does not control. There is no uh, religious omnipotence or, or hegemony or like despotism on the system. So um, now secularism, we say that Canadian government is a secular government. It is not a government that prefers or like um, gives more privilege to one religion over the other. Everyone has the absolute right to believe in any religion or not to believe at all. It's absolutely their right. But if they choose to believe in any religion, they have the absolute right to practice the rituals, um, you know, and they are protected in case someone would attack them. But my question here, which is something that is, I think, more important, uh, to what extent is the Canadian culture a secular culture? Meaning, to what extent do Canadians care about your belief when they choose to befriend you, when they choose to give you a job, or when they choose to vote for you during an election? How secular are people themselves? Well, I mean, to be secular does does not affect any of the above. Like, you, you could be religious, a Muslim or Christian or a Jew, and you can uh, have friends from all the faiths, all the colors, all the uh, races and everything else. And that doesn't make you not secular or secular. Mm -hmm. You might be still having the idea that Oh, they, for example, if we are coming with a bill, we should, uh, we should consult with the religious institution. Whatever is the constitution. But that doesn't, that, that's not secularism. Okay, secularism is the people. What's opinion? If I take opinion of 10 people, sector of 10 people, if five of them are from a specific race and or six of them, let's say, from some specific race. If I consulted those six, they most probably will choose something goes along with their beliefs. But that doesn't mandate me to consult, or I, I can't say that I consulted their religion for that. It's the majority of the people we consulted with them. If they have a specific belief, they will vote specific direction. So the decision might come in a favor of some specific direction does not mean that we consulted that religion on this decision. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. But, you know, let me maybe rephrase my question because maybe um, I might have not been very clear here about my question. Yes. Uh, I'm asking like when, like me as a Canadian, like I'm talking about the mainstream Canadian, and the word Canadian, of course, a Canadian is a Canadian. Like a Canadian does not come from a specific background or have a specific religion. But I'm talking about a Canadian who really believes in the Canadian values and understands the Canadian values. Will that Canadian, you know, bear in their mind your belief or your religion before taking the decision of taking you as their friend or not? or before giving you a job or not, or before voting for you or not? Does like, do they care very much about your uh, religious belief before uh, taking you as their friend or as their like uh, subordinate or as their coworker okay. or giving their vote for you? There, would, there could be a percentage of people who think this way. I mean, in every community like that. But that would be very, 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 very small minority. Like in Canada, the, the people, like we are very famous, like Canadians are very famous worldwide, saying, saying that Canadians are very nice people. They are very accepting people. They are very friendly people. And that's, that's globally, we know like that. 
So yes, we are open and the government, the uh, um, uh, majority of Canadians are very welcoming. They actually sometimes, I would say even very interested, interested and keen to learn more about somebody new. Like if you you are from specific areas, they would need to, they would like to take the time to ask you something about your background. And that's kind of one of the popular discussions not to focus you or corner you or put you in a bad spot as much as yes would like to learn more understand more uh, like i lived in germany for eight months during my study i lived in us i don't think there's any place in the world who are people who are open to diversity to different people to foreign people to immigrants than canadians they are very very kind people and I'm, I'm very proud to be Canadian and I'm very proud to be kind as well so yes well th that's absolutely great and um, so here comes the other follow-up question the very important one really so um, can I succeed in Canada if I'm trying to be a member of Parliament can I succeed by just um, addressing one group of people so like in my speeches, in my talk, in my rhetoric, would I just address one religion, one, um, you know, cultural background, one um, sexual orientation? Can I really succeed and be a good representative in the Canadian parliament? Well, first, first of all, if you are representing one group, how you did win? That's an important question. Like in my writing, we are 120,000 people. Like I have, uh, Egyptians are like less than 5,000, maybe 5,000, 5,000 some in the range of 5,000. But it's the whole writing is broke down into totally uh, multiple ethnicity and multiple races, like uh, maybe 15,000 Pakistani, maybe another 10,000 Indian, maybe 15,000 Chinese and so on. So how did I win with one group? Like mathematically, it's almost impossible unless this group is 50% of the population or 50% of the voter. So that's not the fact of things, right? Number two, if I fake that, become everybody's, and then when I become an MP or MPP, I start representing a specific group, talking about one specific issue. So I, I'm mono community representative, then I'm gonna win the next run. Like how I'm gonna run next, run the next election and win. People see me for four years, ignoring everybody but a specific group. How I'm going to win again? So, so people who think or uh, uh, run rumors that uh, we have uh, uh, some candidates or some MPPs are MPs uh, are uh, mono uh, mono uh, community, they can't survive. They can't. The system would not allow them to survive. The way the vote is going, the way the election is going, they can. And and then then comes the other question here, um, the changing of your partisan affiliation. Is that a common thing amongst voters? So is it common that I can vote uh, for, let's say, the Liberal Party in the federal uh, elections, but vote for the Conservative or the New Democratic Party? in the uh, provincial elections and then the, the next uh, rounds, like four years later, I can do the opposite. Is that a common thing or do people just stick to a specific, you know, partisan affiliation and they never uh, change it? Again, there's, there, of course, there is base hardcore uh, members who believe in a specific ideologies, both left and right and, 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 and uh, conservative, liberal, those are hardcore members of the liberals, hardcore members of conservatives. They are not going to change their mind about the party, even if they don't agree on some of the issues. They might choose not to vote at all for their favorite party, uh, but they will never go and, uh, and vote for the other side. Mm -hmm. And there is majority of the people, majority of the Canadians who are Canadians who would look into the details of the platform, who would interest to understand if you are in power, what are you going to do for me? Or if I'm upset about what you're doing, how I'm going to plan to uh, remove you next election, vote you out. 
sequel next time actually. So um, another like um, illusion or misconception I would say is that uh, some people believe that a specific party, um, like if a specific party in power is in power, this party can have the ability, um, it's, you know, some people believe that it's within the mandate of a ruling party to change some of the basic rights in the Canadian constitution. So can a political party um, change the rights of, let's say, the LGBT community? Can they change the rights of, um, you know, like freedom of speech or like can they change the uh, freedom of belief? Is that possible? Is that at all possible? Okay. Uh, I, let me fix just the records on something. Like mandate is something and ability is different. Mm -hmm. Like there's no mandate on any party to change. Like he's not mandated to change. He's okay. in, able to change. His mandate is to reach some goals. And within those reachability to those goals, he might have to change stuff in the middle, like some specific bill to change the government ability to do things or the way it done it was done or whatever. And uh, majority of time, all the changes are done through bills. So the constitution or the 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 uh, uh, frame of the outline frame of the constitution will allow taking bills in between this margin to to uh, manipulate uh, like to add rights or remove rights or restrict or allow or stuff like that but nobody can attack or can change something is not in their ability so for example if something in the constitution of Ontario human rights talking about human rights talking about uh, uh, freedom of religion, for, to, talk about freedom of speech, talk about uh, uh, um, free health care, like a kind of many of those constitutional rights. A free education. Can or change like, it. Yeah. I mean, at least if you can't change it, you have to open the debate around that through a federal government who can open some of these topics if they want. But as I mentioned, like I don't think any party, whoever, left, right, middle, up, down, blue, orange, yellow, green, uh, would like to get into any debate which can be viewed as taking rights of Canadians. So it's highly level. unlikely to happen that, that I don't party... think any party will take a risk of taking that because I'm telling you, I mean, a government or, or a party can suggest a, a, a change Everybody on the old, all the spec, spectrum of the political spectrum will say this is attack to the private, uh, uh, the private rights of the people, for example. So it's not only the outside or the opposition. Actually, the people from inside the party could view that as attack on the personal or private uh, freedom. And that, that's going to be a nasty thing to do because the party, if he doesn't have support from inside his members, how he will be able to sell that to the outside. Um, then, so definitely this shows us that um, no party would ever really dare to take a step that would challenge the... the no, you know, the, the reason is not daring as much. Why? Like, give me a good reasoning to attack some Canadian value given by the constitution. Definitely, it's a something good because it's in the constitution. We didn't put any, any bad stuff on the constitution, right? So why somebody would go and attack good stuff? Like, mm. like I don't see any even reasoning for a party to think about attacking a, a basic right stated in the constitution of any Canadian. So Canada is a multicultural country. Definitely, it's a big mosaic of different cultural background, yes. it's, it's a canvas of cultures. Um, how much is this reflected in the structure of political parties, both at the federal and provincial levels, and also in terms of the positions they can you know, have? So do we have um, specific um, cultural or like religious or ethnic background that is 
that dominates a political party or just um, you know keeps the leading positions just for itself? Name me one. Like name name a position or a, or a level of a government or a committee or whatever, which uh, all from one group. I mean it can't i mean how they will be able to control something like that anybody like i don't see how the mechanism even even if a party would like to do that how do you be able to do that like you've seen by yourself like uh, i think there's one of our federal parties are headed by like uh, uh sikh uh, uh origin uh, our Minister of Defense was from... Secret yeah, the Defense. NDP, the NDP, the Minister of Defense, they, they, they both wear the, the Sikh turban as well. And there is no, uh, like, nobody gets offended. There's nobody who thinks of opposing that. They did not change their names, which shows a clear uh, Indian... No, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to name a specific group, but in every party, in every government, in every position, in every committee, you will see all the variety you can't think of, color-wise, race-wise, religion-wise, age-wise, you can name it. I mean, name me one. If you think there is some area, is a restricted area, name it to me. Then, then definitely, you know, like we can just simply deduce from that, that it's, it's almost impossible that a party would take a decision that is against a specific ethnic or religious or sexual orientation, because in this case, it will be shooting itself in the foot, really. Like it's hurting itself, it's opposing its own people. So there is no way a party would take a decision against its own people. So uh, since a party is made up uh, from, at all levels, from people from all walks of life and of all different uh, cultural and ethnic backgrounds, therefore any decision taken or any bill, you know, a proposal for a law should always bear this in mind, definitely. And um, Absolutely. I, I, I would say I would even go further than that. Any talk about this kind of, uh, I would say, uh, outrageous, uh, outrageous uh, uh, comments, it, it is reflecting a propaganda from a specific groups trying to use that against the mass number stream mainstream of Canadians who believe that we are a secular government, we're a secular country, we are we are open, we are actually the most open. The Canada is the first country ever I introduced to when I came who actually the activists activists and uh, immigrants immigration uh, groups and immigration agencies make uh, discussions around how can we make the newcomer feel at home. Mm -hmm. I never knew or heard about any other country in the world accepting immigrants trying to think how can we make immigrants feel at home as soon as they arrive to Canada. And honestly, that's true. And I'm not talking about myself, but I'm talking to lots of people who came to Canada from all over the places of the world. They say, Canada, we feel that we are Canadians since the day we touched the land of Canada. And I think that's a big achievement for the Canadians. I really, I'm proud to be Canadian. I'm proud to be uh, uh, a politician, Canadian politician. I'm proud to be uh, new immigrants who enjoyed arriving to Canada and I'm um, still enjoy welcoming new Canadians every day and telling them how great is Canada. Perfect. So um, again, Canada is a democracy and democracy does not mean the dictatorship of the majority. And um, now, this is a very important point, which is like, um, what is the mandate or of each of the, because here in Canada, we have three levels of government. Yes. We have the federal government, we have the provincial or uh, like, you know, uh, government, and then we have the municipal government. 
Yes. These are the three levels of government that we have here in Canada. Yes. So um, you just said that like it's impossible for, for any party to change the basic rights and freedoms, like the right to free education. And we hear when you talk about free education or free healthcare, it is real world-class healthcare and education. It's not just a name of free education, but free education and free healthcare are like world-class, one of the very, very best in the world. And uh, you have like, you know, the rights to vote, the right to right of, of mobility rights, the right to, of, of belief, right of expression, all these are guaranteed. So uh, what is the area where um, a political party can make change? Like uh, within the provincial level and within the federal level, what is the mandate of each one of these two governments or each one of these parliaments? Well, the federal government have their own uh, portfolios. So, for example, the foreign affairs, defense, army, intelligence, national security, uh, immigration, and citizenship. Those are all federal uh, profiles or federal files, uh, fully controlled by the federal borders, the borders uh, agency, and uh, it's managed by the government. Federal government now provincial managed education, healthcare, uh, uh, social uh, social uh, services, uh, housing, ministry of works like uh, some business development and uh, rate tape reduction uh, and uh, uh, long term care, uh, pensions. That's all managed by provincial government. And, and are there any uh, files that are like done with and you know through the collaboration of both the federal and the provincial? There is, of course, lots of files are working together, but again, there is a good, clear separation between the uh, uh, government levels. So we are we understand clearly which government can take a decision. This decision might be influenced or have to be or, or coordinated with uh, their counterparts in the federal or the provincial, vice versa. But we know that who's having the uh, final say in that, like the decision maker, either provincial or federal. So uh, a provincial par a party or a provincial parliament, really, that is led by a specific provincial party, um, has the right to control education because we have the Ministry of Education of Ontario. Mm -hmm. Our driver's license, um, our Ontario driver's license. Ministry of Transportation is Ontario. Absolutely. And also we have our OHIP card, Ontario Health Insurance Program. So it's Ontario, it's not Canada. Yeah. And uh, what else? What else can, can a provincial party... Social services. Like all the welfare, all the social uh, covering, uh, covering uh, some of the daycare costs, costs covering some of the uh, 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 special needs, autism, all those kind of files are provincial files. Social housing, low, low income families uh, housing, all this is, uh, is uh, owned by the provincial government. Well, you, you, you said that like things for the federal government would control things like uh, foreign affairs, defense, uh, national security, secret intelligence, um, you know, uh, budget. Again, how about the budget? Um, like, do we have two separate budgets, federal of budget? Of course, you have budget for those files. So I'm budgeting money for this, 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 and this. If I control it, then I have budget for it. I have to budget for that. So for us, we receive, we, we put the budget for the health care, we put the budget for longer term care, we put the budget for education, we put the budget for affordable housing, we put the budget for municipality affairs, we put the budget for uh, uh, social services. This is all budgeted by the provincial government. So in terms of taxes, for instance, like uh, we have federal taxes, provincial taxes. Yep. Um, and then, so um, for the Canadian budget, if I talk about the budget of Canada now, 
So um, if Ontario, like Ontario and Quebec, they have to be uh, like they are, they are the industrial heart of Canada. They're in central Canada in terms of location. And again, they are the industrial heart of Canada. So they make a uh, huge income. Alberta, again, is a great province for like, uh, it's very rich in minerals, petroleum, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Saskatchewan is like our food basket. And so again, on. again, uh, just to, to uh, maybe to give you examples of mining, forestry, tourism, culture are provincial. Okay, so uh, if each one of these provinces makes a specific profit, like one province might be richer than the other. So do they just keep their money for themselves or do they also contribute to the Canadian budget? They, I think they contribute to the Canadian budget through the taxes they pay. Like, mm -hmm. like the, the federal government collecting taxes for everything we are doing. Uh, so the more we do, the more they make. So, okay. So it is it is basically through the taxing system, from the federal tax, they would um, you know get the taxes from different provinces. And, yes, and so on. Um, again, um, policing in Canada. Uh, you know we have the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. It is the Canada White Police, but we also have police in Toronto or in Montreal. So how does this work? Like uh, OPP, Ontario Provincial Police. Like this is a different level, which is provincial police, which have uh, jurisdiction all over all Ontario. And then you have the standard police. So the, our Peel Police, this is the region of Peel. So mm -hmm. you have three levels, follow the three levels of government too. Same thing. But a provincial police officer would lose um, his authority if he goes out of, a, out of the, the province. So if I'm a policeman in Toronto, if I go to uh, Regina, for instance, I'm no longer a policeman. Yep. Right? I'm just a civilian. But if I'm a member of the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP, I'm a member of the RCMP anywhere. In Canada, it's like FBI, RCMP is equivalent to the FBI. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, okay, last but not least is like you know, is the very hot topic. Is the topic of topics really? Uh, every so, topic is hot. Absolutely, Those days. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> totally agree with you. But the uh, the hottest one of you know the hottest of the hot ones. Um, I would say is COVID definitely, at least since last March. We yes. have a lot of, uh, you know, like opening, closing, partial closures, complete ones. We go from gray, red, um, and so on, different um, levels. Uh, many times people would say that, uh, why is the government doing that? And when they say the government, some people are really confused whose decision it is. Again, with COVID, uh, there are a lot of um, support that's given to Canadian citizens that would help them, you know, to make ends meet, just to, to survive in a, in a very humane and a very respectable way mm -hmm. um, as Canadians. So where do, do these come from? Like the decision to open or close and to support people? Well, the decision to open or close is provincial because the provincial government uh, is the one having the authority to enforce on the ground. Uh, again, like it's not the government decision as much as advice from the chief medical officer who advise to the government that we recommend this based on this and he have to present. So for example, the lockdown today a decision, we had the caucus call in the morning, since the morning for three hours almost, where the chief medical officer have been presenting the numbers, presenting the trends, raising the flags, uh, showing us or convincing the, uh, uh, all the MPPs about uh, his decision and his, um, his belief that we should do this or that this is the decision I believe we should do, the recommendation. So basically, uh, it is provincial, and it's again like it's not 
the government will say like he we will wake in the morning and say guys let's close or today the weather is nice let's open it there is always the umbrella from the chief medical officer who advise us and we take the uh, recommendation or the uh, uh, advice from him based on the public safety and uh, this is our um, most important thing that um, we need to protect what matters most what matters most for our government is the people of Ontario. So we know that yeah. the business is affected. We know that the business is suffering. We know that it's not an easy task. For any government to close business is not an easy task. Believe me, my phone ring 24 by seven because lots of people, business people have my cell phone number. They call, they ask us, they ask is the reasoning Sometimes they are a little bit aggressive than other times, and I understand. I give them all the right. I give them all the reasoning. I understand their suffering. But what we can do is our government is doing their best, both federally and provincially, uh, especially our government, Premier Doug Ford, uh, do a lot of work to make sure that the businesses are compensated, the businesses are able to survive. Maybe they are not in the best mood, not best position, not the best money, but they have to be able to sustain their business. And that's what our mandate are. We are trying to make sure that they can sustain because the time will change. They will open, they will make money, they will make business after the COVID. So uh, towards the very end of this uh, interview, like, uh, is there a kind of prescription you'd like to give to people who are about to vote in any upcoming elections, whether provincial or federal. What are the do's and don'ts uh, with the Canadian standards before taking the decision to vote for party A or B, for like, you know, um, uh, a candidate A or B? What should I do and not do? Well, my best advice, my first advice always, you are a Canadian citizen. You are a good citizen. We are privileged in Canada that we have freedom and we have freedom access to the information. Read, do your homework. Read what this government did, what this government did. If this uh, party did something, are they still insisting in doing it? Are they changing? Is the environment changing? What is the what is the platform, how the platform is going to translate to me first, to me, my family. Are we going to benefit of that? Is that going to hurt me? If something hurts me, I don't, I can't believe that anybody could accept that him or his family interest will be hurt and he will go, still go with it just because I like this color or that color. I don't believe that's, that's kind of what we see here. But just know the facts. Try to spend some time and understand the differences, understand what's a platform, and that will affect me, how this will affect me and my family. This is the most important thing. Don't listen to people who do propaganda, people who are anti-everything, anti-lockdown, anti-vaccine, anti-whatever uh, rights, anti-this rights, anti-that rights. Do your homework. I did my homework. I was a new immigrant and started getting involved to understand. Just trying to understand. I wasn't really, I didn't, when I came to Canada, I didn't understand which government doing what. Is it the provincial, was the federal, was the municipal? I, I, like I, I'm coming from a government which is one level of government, like flat government. So everything is one government. So I can blame everything on one government or can attribute the good things for one government. Now we have different three. And if I keep listening to people, I will never know the facts of things. That's my main, main golden rule. Read, do your homework, understand where the benefits are, who the candidate. Again, the candidate is very important. If this candidate is somebody who I can trust, is it somebody who I can believe, is it somebody who I can Get hold of after. Like I have been, when I was running on knocking doors during my election, the guy said, so are we going to see you next time in 2022? 
I said, why? They said, because that's usually the fact. We see you every four years. I said, no, I'm available. I'm everywhere. And I made sure I'm available everywhere. Like I'm technically speaking everywhere as much as I can. Absolutely. And uh, thank you very much, really, for being with us tonight, MPP Street Sabawi. Really, it has been a pleasure to have you. And thank you very much for this uh, very fruitful discussion and for enlightening us about that. And um, really, dear viewers, like to conclude here, let's always remember where we are. If you are a new immigrant to Canada, uh, be aware of where you are. This is a democracy, and it's the rule of the people, by the people, for the people. And here it is a fact. It's an established fact. It's not only, you know, just empty talk. No, it is a fact here. And it's a country of institutions, not individuals. No individuals. There is no dictatorship. There is no autocracy. There is no despotism. You know, we do not have a, a tyrant, one person who decides, or one group even. It's not an oligarchy. It's not a rule of a specific minority. No, it's not a theocracy. It's not a rule of religion. Again, no. All the human rights are guaranteed freedom of expression, freedom of belief, freedom like mobility rights, transportation, um, um, you know, you have the rights of free education, free healthcare, world class, we're talking here. So you should really be aware of where you are. Democracy does not mean the rule of the, of the dictatorship of the majority. Nothing is done on an arbitrary basis. So I just, you know, like sleep and wake up and ta-da, this is my decision. No, it doesn't go this way. Um, in the parliament, you have first reading, second reading, third reading. There is a caucus for every party. There is royal assent after that. So it's, it's a very lengthy process for any decision to be taken. It's not that easy. Again, if you want to follow up on previous hearings, previous debates in the parliament, they're all online. You can see them. So there's no excuse, really. If I say... I don't know how does this party think. Well, just go and watch them. Watch them perform in the parliament, whether the provincial parliament or the, you know, um, um, federal parliament. It's your right. You have the right. So uh, don't let anybody deprive you from your right. Don't let anybody choose for you. It is your choice. It's up to you to see you know, the future of yourself and your children. Don't keep it to other people to decide things for you. Do your homework. And no one, no one, never believe the big lie that anyone can, uh, you know, deprive you of your basic rights or, or deny any of these basic rights for you. Dear viewers, thank you very much for your kind listening and following us tonight. Until we meet again, have a very pleasant evening. Bye-bye.